Good afternoon. Let me invite people who want to take chairs to come to the front. I know it's uncommon for her, uh, the start of class, but you can get these chairs at half price. And as the term goes on, you may have to pay for luggage and water, but now's the time. So a few words to get us set. To all who are returning today, welcome back. And to all who are new, new students, new faculty and staff, new administrators, and new members of PSU's first board of trustees, welcome aboard. I am Bob Liebman, faculty senate presiding officer. I work as a sociologist with interest in organizations and social change, especially mergers and splits in denominations, political parties, and so on. This was a banner year for splits and near splits. As some of you know from last week's vote on Scotland's independence, and as you know, the no's won and the union held. So too at PSU, where last April we stood on the edge of a split and the union held. It was a deep learning moment for me. What have I learned? Universities are places where people are encouraged and enabled to give voice. Our respect for voice fits with the skill set we call the liberal arts. Listening, reading, writing, and speaking. And we teach those skills in the service of an honored principle that we agree to disagree. Good classroom discussions push back on what's said in lecture. Our very best students win prizes by challenging the knowledge that their professors established. Critical thinking is the fuel for both science and democracy. And so campuses are places of spirited debate. Demo debate sharpens our thinking, but it also highlights our differences. But there is another side. Our differences are counterbalanced by stickiness. Loyalty or plain love for PSU makes us stick together. And convocation this day is the time to put aside differences in rank, discipline, and orientation to stand together with the wish to not only start the year on the right foot, but to end it knowing that things are measurably better, boosting student success through mentoring and advising, strengthening the synergy of teaching and research, enhancing Oregon through our scholarship and our graduates. But bold ambition, bumps against declining state funding and rising tuition in Oregon, how can we advance with limited resources? That is today's question. As we face a year of challenging conversations about our future, 2014 is the year of the plan. But a plan in two dimensions, one for academic program prioritization, another for strategic planning. Program prioritization brings data into dialogue about curriculum and staffing. Strategic planning is the dialogue among all stakeholders on goals and measures and the means to realize them. To ask what must be invested in instruction at a time when enrollment is the lifeblood of our university? How can we build our reputation at a time of doubt about the worth of higher education? How can we broaden our circle of support by legislators, alumni, the public, and donors? All of you have roles to play in delivering these questions in town meetings and through committees that will help make the plan over the coming year. But as urban planners tell me, the plan is not the end. It is, in fact, only the beginning. Plan making requires many hands, and the best is a plan that has many handles. Successful implementation means having handles that you will grasp to turn ideas into actions to make PSU a better place to learn and to work, a place one would be proud to learn as a student or to work as faculty or staff. How can the plan become for you and your unit a plan for action? Last year, a near split became a learning moment that taught us to trust our capacity for commitment and creative engagement in the face of constraint and division. No surprise. At PSU, we have always punched above our weight and do it while living within our means. That gives me confidence as I look ahead. 
This year, we're at the edge of a teaching moment, a year-long conversation to which President Vivell has welcomed the faculty senate, administration, students, and the ASPSU, faculty and staff represented by AUP, SEIU, and AFT, alumni, trustees, and all other stakeholders who care for PSU because PSU is Portland's university. My call to you today is to take your passion for this place and the knowledge and experience you can share to seize PSU's teaching moment. So if a call comes from Vim or Sana Andrews or Pam Miller or Kelly Cowan or Mark Neisenfeld or Eric Knoll or me, please pick up <laughs> and say yes. This is a moment when we can do much good if we do the work together. Now it is my pleasure to introduce a fellow sociologist, a colleague, and our president, Vim Vivell. We've always thought of sociologists as the kings of the disciplines, right, Bob? <laughs> well, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's great to uh, be here again at another convocation and have everybody uh, come together. And I appreciate your comments and, and remarks, Bob. I think they're right on topic. Sure. Thank you. Should just get that on you there. Sorry. Sorry, everyone. OK, we'll put this here. This way I don't quite have to be tied to the podium. Um, we have a whole lot to talk about today, but I really want to start out by uh, thanking everybody for all the work that you did last year and all the work that I know you did over the summer to get ready for this fall. Uh, thank you to the faculty, of course, for everything you do for our students. And thank you to all the staff for the enormous amount of work that goes into not just getting the place ready for this year, getting all the students admitted and enrolled, but for all the work that goes on every single day. We really are doing great things together. The thing that really probably over this summer excited me most was the opening of the Collaborative Life Sciences Building. If you haven't been there, I absolutely encourage you to go visit. I think it is truly a game changer, certainly for our biology and chemistry programs, but through that, I think beyond that and really for the whole institution. I got a guided tour just a couple of weeks ago uh, by Gwen Schusterman from chemistry, uh, Jason Podrowski from uh, biology, and, and Bob Strong and also from chemistry. And it was just absolutely infectious to see their enthusiasm about these gorgeous spaces. Now, Gwen explained to me, is Gwen, are you in the audience here today? Yeah, there she is. Gwen explained to me how she's getting ready for her no lecture, problem-based only introduction to chemistry class for 400 students. Looking up the, into that big auditorium, I told her she's a very brave woman indeed. And thinking about Gwen in front of 400 students, I was reminded uh, of an old movie with uh, Burt Reynolds, of all people, as an adjunct instructor. <laughs> you see him walk into the classroom for the first time of class, and you see the clock. He starts his lecture exactly at 9 o'clock. Then the picture fades out. Then it fades in again as he hit, is wrapping up his lecture. Cut to the clock, which now says 10 after 9. And rather sheepishly, he says, I guess I need to prepare more material next time. <laughs> and that resonated with me, I guess, because when I started out as an instructor at Illinois Chicago, frankly, that was my biggest fear, running out of material. And I didn't grow out of that until uh, a friend of mine told me that I should stop thinking about students as empty vats that I had to fill, but that students, of course, brought their own experiences and knowledge to the classroom, and that in time of need, I can always turn to a discussion topic, and we could uh, go on from there. Now, uh, that brings me to the thrust of what I want to talk about today. I'm no longer afraid of running out of things to say. I haven't had that problem in a while. Uh, but as we move forward on a new strategic planning initiative 
which is aimed at ensuring PSU remains competitive and vital, I'm asking you to share your experiences, insights, ideas. It's a project I have been asked to lead by our board of trustees, but it will not be top down. Our goal is very much for this to be very inclusive, transparent, and the board will rely heavily on your input as we discuss and decide what kind of universe we want and need PSU to be. To me, it's ultimately an exercise in discovering uh, what unites us as a university and how we can succeed together. Now I know, and Bob alluded to this a bit, I know there may be some lingering skepticism among some of you because last academic year we did have difficult conversations. You know, there was a lot of stuff that got taped on the walls everywhere. Um, and there was a lot about it that I didn't like. But the one I disliked, frankly, the most was the one with the two arrows going in different directions, suggesting that faculty and students were going one way and administration was going the other way, taking PSU in the wrong direction. I believe that nothing could be further from the truth. I think we actually have a greater shared commitment to our mission at Portland State than at almost any other campus. I think that let knowledge serve the city truly unites us. It is really our collective North Star. Where we may well have differences, not necessarily between faculty and students on one side and administration on the other, but I think between any number of groups and units on campus is about how best to achieve that goal, that letting knowledge serve the city. How much do we best invest in research support or teaching or student advisors or our buildings? How much in the humanities, sciences, engineering, the professional schools? How much in fundraising, telling our story publicly, protecting ourselves against legal and other risks? We know we have to do all of those, but exactly to what extent, now or later? We need a new university-wide discussion about these issues. Now, no strategic plan is going to resolve all of these questions, but we need a shared understanding of where we're going and that the differences about specific priorities at any one time do not mean we're pulling in different directions. Now, I think that our current strategic plan has served as well these past six years, but the world is changing very, very fast. As you know, educa higher education here in Oregon and nationally is in a period of upheaval. There's a spirited national debate about the value of a college degree. Our college costs too high, is debt too burdensome, our job prospects too low to justify spending four, six, or eight years at a university. We all know that the numbers bear out that a college education is still a great investment, assuming you actually finish with a degree. And we have to be sure that we help our students achieve that. You know that universities also face, because of this debate about student debt, increased pressure to put more emphasis on job readiness, as opposed to education for lifelong learning and citizenship. Where do we see ourselves on that continuum? What is the right mix? And how do we help our students make the decisions that are right for them? And as you know, online education, while not the panacea that people maybe thought a couple of years ago, continues to grow. How do we respond, building on what we are already doing? For which students, delivered in what way, does it provide the opportunity to get an education they simply wouldn't have otherwise? And where is it just a thin substitute for the real thing? Competition for students and enrollment is as fierce as I've ever seen it. How do we make sure that we appeal to the students that we can serve best? And how do we retain Portland State's role, the broader role as an agent of culture for Portland and Oregon as a crucial part of the state's economic development engine, as a catalyst for building community? These are all questions that we as faculty, staff, students and administrators and all of our friends around us must answer. 
if we are to make progress in our overall goal of being a leading public urban university, as our mission statement says, then we need to decide what key changes and initiatives we want to undertake in our course offerings, methods of delivery, staffing, funding, et cetera. We have to look at the mix of our faculty from a purposeful, not just a budgetary perspective, as well as the proper role of all other aspects of campus life and operations. What do we want PSU to be and how do we achieve that? I'll tell you my starting point on this. I start with a commitment, and again, Bob alluded to this, to the core values that make PSU unique and that I think unite all of us and at the same time differentiate us from many other institutions of higher education. Let knowledge serve the city. We do that by providing access and opportunity for the people of greater Portland and Oregon. That's our greatest mission. We also pursue nationally and internationally recognized excellence in, a, in areas where we have a competitive advantage or historical strength. And we don't lose sight of what distinguishes us among universities, our deep community involvement and our walk the talk approach to sustainability. The guiding themes that we set out six years ago still are relevant. Provide civic leadership through partnerships, improve student success, achieve global excellence, expand educational opportunities, and expand our resources. These are what make PSU great, and these are what we will build on as we set our future course. Now, last spring, we gathered, in May, I think it was, more than 80 faculty, staff, administrators, students, board members, and we brainstormed how we want this planning to go. It was all about the process. And one of the exercises we did was to imagine a headline we'd like to read about PSU in a national publication five years from now. Some examples from The Economist. Oregon achieves 40-40-20 with PSU leading the way. From the New York Times, PSU, the gold standard for urban universities. And my personal favorite from the Wall Street Journal, Buffett and Gates endowed PSU with $1 billion. <laughs> that would certainly make our job easier. Now, the point is, we need to be aspirational while staying grounded. We actually did increase our fundraising threefold, from $13 million 14 years ago, four years ago to $40 million last year, and will continue to grow. But I'm not going to pin our aspirations for PSU on a billion-dollar pipe dream. I don't think that's helpful. But let's at the same time give ourselves permission to dream bigger as we lay out the floor plan for PSU's next evolution. And that's where you all come in. Success will be measured to a great extent by how much faculty, staff, students, and other community members get involved. You'll have ample opportunity to participate in the discussions and decisions. We will be holding town hall style meetings, smaller focus groups, conducting opinion surveys, web-based surveys, and so on. And perhaps the most immediate way to join the conversation is on the PSU website, the president's page to be specific. As of today, we will have an interactive feature for you to register your ideas, comments, critiques, and so forth. We want to complete the new plan by fall of 2015, and we will deeply integrate it with the other planning efforts that are going on, such as the academic program prioritization and some of the colleges that are doing their individual plans. Obviously, we have a busy and demanding year ahead of us, but I don't know whether it's ever been different than that. I'm looking forward to it because I believe that this is the sort of challenge that brings us together as a campus, and I'm excited to get started on this. Now, I came here six years ago. I've been here now six years and 25 days, I believe. And I came here, and I was excited to come here because I've always loved cities. And I've dedicated my working and scholarship life to having universities help cities become great, economically thriving, culturally vibrant, socially just, and environmentally sustainable. 
providing opportunities for students to grow and develop, learn the skills to become contributing members of society, succeed as a community member is the core of this work. Let me just share some stories about incoming students. Sarah Florig was diagnosed with leukemia in high school. Six months into a chemotherapy regimen, she had a rare neurological reaction that left her temporarily paralyzed and unable to speak. With much hard work, she regained her normal functions, but to keep up, she completed most of her high school work from her hospital bed. Another student, Sophie Biddle, was a straight A student who dropped out of high school because she was bored and got bullied. Instead, she got her own education, working at a farmer's market, learned how to spin her own yarn, milk a goat, and could even tell the breed of a chicken by the color of his eggshell, a real Portland thing. <laughs> Benita Gleba faced religious persecution in Ukraine and later poverty in the United States. Her family immigrated here. They started out living in an aunt's two-bedroom apartment with 11 relatives. But all three have in common is they will start this fall in our Honors College, which is welcoming 200 such students this year. <laughs> it's stories like these, students like these, that breathe life into what we do every day at PSU. Our research, our cultural, athletic, economic, and social programs and events all contribute and are absolutely integral to what it means to be an institution of higher education. I remain enthused about this mission and hope you will engage with me and each other as we plan how to make PSU truly that leading urban public university we want it to be. Thank you very much and look forward to a great year. everyone. For those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Sana Andrews and I'm your Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs here at Portland State. I'd like to start with a, uh, with a video before we do the award announcements. Um, that is a campaign that we have here at PSU. You may have seen it on the sides of the backs or other places called Fearless. So with that, I'd like to show a video. If you want to leave your mark on the world, you can't be afraid to get your hands dirty. You have to grab the moment, right? Because when you are fearless in what you want to accomplish, doors open. At PSU, we believe that knowledge has no limits. That learning doesn't end in the classroom. That students help build cities. That faculty push the boundaries of physics and imagination. And our graduates, let's just say they're not afraid to dream big. Portland State University, together we are fearless. Thank you. Give us a little applause. And, and just to demonstrate that I too can be fearless, uh, I was at the College of the Arts retreat yesterday and I made a wager with them. So who in the room has on green sunglasses? A few of them. I told them if they wore their green sunglasses, that I would put on a pair of green sunglasses. I can't read with these. But these sunglasses, I am told, represent a bright future. And we need sunglasses, a bright future for PSU. So I want to thank the College of the Arts for having some creativity. Um, so it is, it is my pleasure to, um, to actually introduce a number of our award recipients. And at Convocation, we have typically recognized four recipients of our Excellence Awards for faculty and staff. And this year, the Office of Research and Strategic Partnerships has three new faculty awards to recognize achievement in research. All seven of these awards carry an honorarium and are really demonstrating the high recognition that we like to give our faculty here at Portland State. So the first award is the Branford Price Millar Award, given annually to a tenure-related faculty member 
who has demonstrated excellence in the areas of scholarship, instruction, university service, and public service, and whose performance in the area of scholarship and research or other creative activity is judged to be exceptional. Branford Price Millar was the third president of Portland State College, serving from 1959 to 1968. Described as intelligent and unpretentious and principled, Millar was a Harvard-educated scholar of English literature devoted to the liberal arts as the foundation of a college or university. This year's recipient of the Millar Award is David Mayer, Meyer. <laughs> I, did that at the, I did that at the graduation luncheon and I said I would pronounce the name correctly. Um, uh, so David is a Massey Professor of Emerging Technologies in the Massey College of Engineering and Computer Science. The nominators praised him for his high regard as a globally renowned scholar and widely admired colleague whose research spans both theory and systems with great success. His scientific breadth and depth have made him a valuable member in the many interdisciplinary research teams and projects. His instruction is highly praised by students and colleagues alike. They note his curiosity, quick insight, creativity, enthusiasm, and ability to explain complex information with ease, along with his supportive and respectful advising. His contributions inside and outside of the university are many. He gives generous, generously of his time for the benefit of both academic and professional communities. The Branford Price Millar Award is given in recognition of his outstanding service and achievements. Please join me in recognizing David Mayer Meyer, <laughs> David Meyer, recipient of the 2014 Branford Price Millar Award. David, so I was on an airplane almost 20 years ago where I had an interesting conversation with my seatmate. He recalled how he started out with a large air conditioning manufacturer and had been set to troubleshoot an installation in Las Vegas for an important client. While he was working, a gentleman in a gray flannel shirt and slippers came and asked if he could watch, offered to fetch tools or to send into town for parts. At the end of the day, the staff where my seatmate was working told him that his helper was Howard Hughes. <laughs> Hughes showed up again the next day and told him he was very good at what he did and should become an independent refrigeration consultant. Hughes even offered to pay him a day a week initially to get his business started. He took up the offer and launched a successful consulting firm. He ended up in Hood River and was cutting back on consulting when I met him, but spending time helping people start their own businesses. The conversation then turned to me. He asked me where I worked and what I did. I explained I taught computer science at Oregon Graduate Institute. He suggested that I should instead start an independent consulting career. <laughs> and gave me a bunch of marketing tips. While I had done some consulting previously and enjoyed it, the prospect of shifting to, to it full time didn't enthuse me. But I couldn't explain why at that moment. So the next, over the next few days, I mulled over why a switch to full time consulting didn't appeal and I realized it had to do with legacy. The legacy of my friend on the plane wasn't his air conditioning consultancy. That was going to go away when he retired. Rather, his legacy was all the companies he started by the people he helped. And I realized that my legacy was building a CS graduate program in the Portland area. Being a consultant would have helped his legacy and not mine. So fast forward to 2004. OGI was in a crunch from a drop in employer paid tuition and tighter federal research funding. The administration was proposing buyouts to several faculty in my department. I knew if those people departed, other faculty who worked with them would have less reason to stay, and this wonderful group of people I helped recruit would scatter in all directions. It was profoundly upsetting to contemplate my legacy evaporating. At that point, a plan was hatched to move a chunk of the computer science faculty to Portland State, which had recently had its own PhD program approved. I was approached by colleagues as to whether I would put my support behind such a move. After agonizing over the decision for nearly 45 seconds, 
<laughs> I said I would. While not everyone moved over to Portland State, all who did are still here. It was a good decision. I feel my legacy has been largely conserved and in some ways expanded. I'm grateful that Portland State let me continue as a teacher and a scholar in Portland. Thank you to my nominators and thank you to all who welcomed me here. Thank you, Professor Meyer. Um, the next award is the George C. Hoffman Award, and it's given annually to a tenure-related faculty member in recognition of distinguished contributions to the university in the areas of instruction, research, university service, and scholarship, which are done in the spirit of humanism, civility, and collegiality with particular dedication to students and loyalty to the university. These are values cherished by the late George C. Hoffman, a distinguished dean and professor of history at Portland State University. This year's recipient of the Hoffman Award is Mary King, professor of economics in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Professor King's nominators note that she is a standout classroom lecturer, a mentor, and a constant advocate for her students. Students praise her brilliant grasp of the subject she teaches her commitment to connecting the classroom and their lives, and her determination and support to help them accomplish their goals. Professor King's service to the university and the committee, its communities it serves are intertwined with her work as a teacher and scholar. She has been a forceful presence to diversity and internationalizing the curriculum. She collaborated with colleagues within her college and throughout the university to make the sustainability initiative academically and intellectually meaningful and substantive. She is widely known as a pioneering figure in the emergence of feminist economics and considered an established and respected labor economist. Please join me in recognizing Professor King, recipient of the 2014 George C. Hoffman Award. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a thrill. It's an honor. It's humbling. I know so many of you dedicate yourselves year after year after year with limited recognition to this important project of building a strong, excellent access university through decades of cuts, relentless media disparagement of public employees, Embedded in national trends PSU can't afford, emphasizing growth in administration, athletics, and real estate, sometimes at the cost of academics, and in a depressing national discourse, apparently driven by the conviction that education for the non-elite should be cheap, based on a manufacturing model and motivated by new technology rather than the keys to imparting higher order skills. My hat is off to all of you having stood up together in defense of academic values last year and ready still to throw yourselves into another school year. As you go forward, I ask you to consider three principles. Prioritizing a more student-centered budget, becoming more socially sustainable, and building strategically on our strengths. We know we need to adjust to the new reality that students are paying the bills and going into unconscionable levels of debt to do it, which means we need a more student-centered budget. Students can't be financing anything but the highest quality academics we can provide them. They can't be responsible for the next cohort or economic development or any kinds of legacy projects that are really the jobs of others. Second, President Vivelle has really rightly highlighted universities as one of a decreasing number of institutions large employers truly tied to place. To anchor our region, we need to be socially as well as environmentally sustainable. PSU has to reverse course on our path toward a contingent and precarious faculty, hired increasingly in part-time and short-term positions. A hundred years ago, employers that didn't provide decent livings were termed parasitic in recognition of the social costs of their employment practices. 
PSU should be founded on stable, good jobs that support family and community life, as well as our student body and our programs. And third, we need to be building on our unique and substantial strengths, as President Vivell suggests, innovating rather than applying templates developed for other, maybe easier situations. Young people move here to participate in creating a more humane ecological society. Environmental aspects of all disciplines, community development and capstones, just to name a few, are all great examples of PSU building on faculty strengths and strong local interests. As well as developing more PhDs, we could offer a multitude of three to four course certificates based on classes we already teach that highlight topics Portlanders want to know more about. Basic business skills, renewable energy, inclusive kids literature, my husband made me cut this list. <laughs> Portland's an active city. Let's shift from spending millions of dollars in tuition on ath for athletics to nurturing a culture in which everybody exercises. Portland loves hiking, biking, yoga, cleaning up, and swimming in the Willamette, and even adult kickball in my neighborhood. Let's leave behind the costs and concussions of football, and let's join Soccer City USA. Let's have the nation's best samba marching band. Let's think more about what we can create instead of what we can cut. So today, as for the past 20 year, 22 years, I have big worries and high hopes for PSU. Thanks so much to all of you for sharing them, for your dedication, and for the chance to have worked with you to make PSU the university it can and should be. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Professor King. The Kenneth W. and Elise W. Butler Award for Library Faculty Service is given annually to a member of the library faculty to recognize excellence of library service to students, faculty, and patrons of the university library. Kenneth Butler retired from the faculty in 1987 after 33 years of dedicated service alongside his wife whose children, who was a children's librarian and a strong supporter of the library as well, and they established this fund. This year's recipient of the Butler Award is Tom Larson, head of monographic cataloging and professor of resource services in the university library. Professor Larson's nominators shared that he's been an essential member of several technologically focused committees, including the shared ILS team and the group overseeing PSU's library transition to a new cataloging and acquisition system. Professor Larson's colleagues in the library and the greater community praise his leadership, his collegiality, and his technological expertise. He is also known as a dedicated ally to local and global indigenous communities. As subject liaison to the Indigenous Nations Studies at Portland State University, he has demonstrated a profound commitment to and an immeasurable knowledge of the program. Additionally, Professor Larson has made significant contributions over the years to the local library consortium, the Orbitz Cascade Alliance, to benefit teaching and research across the entire Northwest. Please join me in recognizing Professor Tom Larson, recipient of the 2014 Butler Award. In 1562, Diego de Landa, in an effort to wipe out native Maya religion, gathered all of the books he could find written in the native hieroglyphic script and burned them. Only three or four such books are known to have survived. This is not the first nor the last time an attempt was made to destroy the cultural heritage of a people by burning their books or destroying their libraries. History is riddled with examples of such biblioclasm. After the founding of the Qin Dynasty in China in 261 BC, unapproved books were burned to suppress intellectual discussion and unify political thought. 
The libraries of Baghdad were destroyed by invading Mongols in 1258, but not before Nasir al-Din al-Tusi rescued some 400,000 manuscripts. The Nazis purged libraries of offensive materials, quote unquote, and restocked them with uh, ones expressing their racist views. On the other hand, much of the intellectual, and herit intellectual heritage of Germany was also destroyed by Allied carpet bombing of German cities. In the 1970s, Cambodia was brought to the brink of cultural annihilation by the Khmer Rouge in an attempt to create a new utopian society. Many other examples could be cited up to the present day. The destruction of libraries is often less dramatic, occurring not via bombs and looting, but via budget cuts and neglect. This is nothing new either. The great library at Alexandria is often said to have been destroyed by fire, obliterating much of the cultural heritage of the ancient Mediterranean world. This has variously been attributed to Julius Caesar, to the Emperor Aurelian, the Coptic Pope Theophilus' attempt to suppress paganism and by invading Arab troops. However, Luciano Confora has argued that the library's demise was actually more gradual than these stories would suggest. By the time the Arab troops arrived in 639, the library, through centuries of neglect, was but a shadow of what it was when it was founded in 283 BC. Through all of this, librarians have done what they can to preserve our cultural and intellectual heritage from destruction and neglect and to make it accessible. It would be ridiculous of me to stand here and claim that Portland State librarians routinely dodge bullets and rush into burning buildings. <laughs> Though I would like to think that at least some of us would if we had to, much in the spirit of Nasir al-Din al-Tusi. Nevertheless, acquiring, preserving, and making accessible the fruits of our scholarship is basically what we're all about, though we generally work in more mundane ways. Some work openly, serving the public and teaching library users how to find and use materials. Others, such as myself, work behind the scenes in resource services and technology. Nevertheless, we all have a common purpose in supporting the scholarly output of our students and faculty, resisting the forces that would destroy or diminish the value of our heritage. I am grateful to my colleagues and the Butler family for recognize my, recognizing my small contributions to these endeavors. Thank you, Professor Larson. The next award is the Mary H. Cumston Award for service to students and is given annually to an academic professional of non-academic rank and someone who's demonstrated excellence in the area of service to students. The late Mary H. Cumston was the former career service director and was a beloved colleague whose endearing contributions to Portland State and to the community have enhanced at the development and the delivery of student services. This year's recipient of the award is David Coronado, Executive Director of Oregon MESA, and MESA, for those of you who don't know, stands for Math, Engineering, and Science Achievement in the Massey College of Engineering and Computer Science. Nominators of Mr. Coronado talk about how he instituted a sustainable vision and a funding model for the MESA program, which continually supports the sixth through 12th grade students and their families with engineering education and college access opportunities. He has also secured funding to expand programs into Salem, and he is active in revitalizing Mesa USA, which has earned him the unanimous nomination as president of the organization, where his vision and leadership will impact over 45,000 K through 16 students annually. In addition to mentoring students throughout Oregon, Mesa, and PSU's S-3 Bridge Program, Mr. Coronado mentors students through the Oregon Aspire Program. He is also active in helping underrepresented students across the state succeed during using his own personal time. Please join me in recognizing David Coronado, the recipient of the 2014 Cumston Award.
Well, thank you very much. This is an honor for me. I'm not one who's big on awards. I'm usually the person that's behind the scenes. It was here, actually, I've been at PSU 10 years. I started here in this, in this room, which actually Hoffman Hall was the room at the time, at convocation. I was a young, I would say a very young person at the time in my age and experience. And I was also one of the few diverse people around me when I first arrived here. Over the years, I've come to learn a lot about life. I've learned a lot being here at PSU. And what I valued about PSU is the diversity that it serves the students. And my work, a lot of it's with Mesa and K-12, but there's a social responsibility that institutions have to the community in creating the pipeline of serving students and ensuring that they're successful throughout their career. I created, co-created the S3 Scholars for Success in the STEM program, which I just spent the last three days in Manuka. We, uh, some of the folks are back here. We've had a lot of great time karaoke. These are a new cohort of diverse students, women students to go into the field of engineering. For me, I was the first. I've heard that a lot. And, and for me, it's lost a little bit of meaning over time. And I always remind myself that you shouldn't. Being the first is being a trailblazer. And I love the trailblazers. <laughs> a lot of times, I was talking to Hilma here, and she inspired me, and we're going to miss you very much, is that being a diverse person also means being the first, but it also means being the role model and being the first and modeling what people of color can do. Because often when you walk around, there is an assumption that people of color are maybe not necessarily at par with everybody else. And when you walk into a room and you're the only person of color and everyone says, well, let's talk about those Hispanic students. What do you think, David? <laughs> what do you think, Lucy? <laughs> I try to be the leader but I also try to be humble. I only speak for myself and the experience that I've shared, but I cannot do this work without the support of my administration in the Massey College. Over the years, I've been there, that's been my home. Uh, recently, we have Ren Su, Barbara, Jim, thank you so much for providing me the support to really do the work that we want to do. And also, I want to ensure that this word is dedicated to those who do not get this recognition um, on a daily basis. I want to give thanks to my support team, Tamara DePew, who's my colleague, uh, to Linda Wasson, Ural De Ruin, uh, Jody Stegmaier, uh, and Frank Oviarts, who are part of the student services team. And there's many more in my college across the university I've met over the years. And I want to say thank you to you for all the work that you do on the front lines, because often it's overlooked. And I want to say thank you personally, because I know when the students come to me and they're starting talking about all the different support, it really does take that community to get a student from their enrollment to graduation. And without you, this would not occur. So I just want to conclude. Thank you very much. And I want to say a special thank you to Kelly Cosano. She was the ringleader for making this happen, because I don't like awards. <laughs> so I want to give her a special thanks. She was a PSU grad student, just graduated this June, and I added her to my staff. And I tell her, I'll keep you as long as I can afford you. Thank you again for this award. So thank you, Mr. Coronado. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce my colleague, uh, John Fink, the Vice President of Research and Strategic Partnerships, to introduce the new research awards that have been initiated this year at PSU. Thank you, Sana. I've been here uh, four years, and we've spent the last four years in the research office really focusing on back office types of things, trying to improve the services that allow all of you as faculty that do research to do a better job. But we realized that none of the work that we do would make any sense at all if it weren't for all the research that you're doing. So we decided to create these rewards last spring. And um, they don't have names associated with them like Millard and Hoffman. And, and we hope that in future years, maybe next year they will, maybe with some of your names on them. So um, we have three awards, one for uh, research faculty and non-tenure track faculty, one for junior faculty at assistant or associate level, and one for senior faculty at the full professor level. Two of the three recipients uh, were not able to be here today because of uh, research commitments. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about them first, and then we do have one of the three, uh, three here today. So the, the awards are based on um, the excellence of the research uh, and all the th criteria you would think of, but in particular the contributions that they've made while they're at PSU. And what's true about the three awardees today 
is they could be at many other universities besides PSU. And I think that's the case for, oops, for uh, many of you, maybe all of you, that people choose to be at PSU because of the special opportunities that it offers. And so the three recipients today are like that. So the uh, first award is uh, for the uh, research assistant uh, research assistant professor Ed Zaron. This is a really tough one because we wanted to call these research excellence, faculty research excellence awards, but for a research faculty member, it just got very confusing. Anyway, Ed is uh, in civil and environmental engineering. He's an expert on coastal and marine processes and fluid dynamics. His work is highly cited uh, in studies of climate change and how climate change is affecting coastal areas, uh, particularly in Oregon and Washington. Um, so, uh, if we can have a quick clap for Ed, who's not here. Thank you. And then, uh, dropping down to the third one for the um, uh, senior, research faculty, senior Faculty Research Excellence Award, I'll get this figured out in the next couple of years, uh, is Jim Pankow. And uh, Dr. Pankow is one of the leading environmental chemists in the world. Uh, he works on air pollution, water pollution, and the effects of smoking on health. Uh, and based on the research that he did both here, but, but more of the work he did earlier at Oregon Graduate Institute, uh, he uh, became, I think, PSU's first member of the National Academy of Engineering in 2009. Um, and uh, Jim recently got a large award from the Murdoch Trust to bring the fastest supercomputer to PSU for studying climate change. So there's a theme here. Uh, and Jim is in, as it says, in civil and environmental engineering and also in the uh, chemistry department. So let's have a quick thanks for Jim. And then the Junior Faculty uh, Research Excellence Award goes to Steve Thorne. Uh, Steve is not actually that junior. Uh, he's had a, had a distinguished career before coming to PSU from uh, a few other institutions. Uh, he's in the Department of World Language and Literature, and his, he's the kind of person whose work is the type that university presidents often make fun of. You know, they say, oh, well, we have these people who are doing, studying Urdu and these other uh, ancient languages, and Steve does all that. He's also focusing on second language acquisition, which is very important in cultures like Portland's. Um, but Steve is also uh, not just an ancient, focused on ancient studies. He uses computer games to teach people how to learn new languages and second languages. So Steve, uh, if you could come up and say a word. He didn't know that he was going to be doing this until about an hour ago. Yeah, yeah, keep it short. Yes, this will be uh, somewhat improvisational and extemporary. Um, first, uh, in hearkening back to uh, my first uh, language passion, which was Sanskrit, uh, even the carnival's tumblers boy cannot stand on his own shoulders, right? So this, the fact that I'm standing in front of you, actually is just the very wee tip of the visible iceberg, and the rest of it is all of the collaborators uh, that, whose uh, uh, work I've benefited from, the dialogues uh, that I've had with them either directly uh, inform my work uh, in terms of co-authorship or inform my thinking that resulted in that kind of work, and so really this is truly a, collab a collaborative and collective venture. Um, and uh, I really feel very fortunate to have been able to come to Portland State University. And in the last three years, while I expected many things, one of the things that's impressed me very deeply has been the intellectual, academic, and research wells that there are to draw from here on this very campus. Like many of you, many of my uh, uh, interactions, collaborations, and networks are outside the institution. But increasingly, in col with colleagues who are in the language-focused areas of uh, English, for example, applied linguistics, my own Department of World Languages and Literatures, communication, we're developing uh, data sessions and, and interaction uh, that results in the kinds of formative interventions that include a research base, but that also directly impact and we hope improve or ameliorate conditions for learning, conditions for shifting social class standing through education, and that directly result, we hope, in an enriched, uh, empowered urban environment here uh, in the metropolitan area of Portland. So I feel very blessed and very fortunate, uh, and I look forward to continuing this effort and increasing the ecological validity between what we do on campus 
and the real world applications, including other kinds of academic applications of the things we do here. Um, uh, and as Mark Twain once argued uh, uh, or observed, uh, I was greatly discouraged when upon arriving in France, I found no intermediate French speakers there. <laughs> and so we need to work on this ecological validity issue, right? We need to tie what we're doing to real world outcomes. And many of the formative interventions that I've been very blessed to be able to move forward uh, here at Portland State or have been invited to participate in, including the Rethink proposals, for example, which I think uh, were fantastically productive in generating conversation. Uh, is, uh, is a really important starting point. So again, I'm, I feel very fortunate to be here. I'd like to thank both the people who nominated me and eventually selected me for this award, uh, and I look forward to the uh, weeks, months, years, uh, decades to come. Thank you, Steve. I'm going to turn it back to Sana now for the rest of the program. Well, so for those of you who this is your first convocation, you can see that we, we use the event for some table setting uh, for the year, and we use it to recognize a number of faculty who've achieved awards, but we also use it to recognize our new employees. So can those new faculty and staff to the university please stand up so we can give you an applause? We, we truly do welcome you, and it's, um, I'm just delighted to say that this year we actually hired 48 new faculty members, 30 of whom are tenure or tenure track faculty members. So 48 new faculty members, 30 that are tenure, tenure track. We also use this occasion to acknowledge those faculty members that have been promoted or tenured at the university. And I always like to report on that. And this year, we had um, a number of successful promotions and tenures. Uh, 25 faculty were promoted to associate professor with indefinite tenure. Another four faculty were awarded tenure only. And there were 49 faculty who were promoted into other ranks, including 10 into emeritus. And our website does list the names of all of those individuals. But for those who are here today, that were promoted or tenured this, for this past year or this year, can you please rise so we can also acknowledge you. And then I have one commercial announcement before we break um, for refreshments. Um, and that is to remind everyone about Portland State of Mind, which begins October 17th and runs for 10 days. There are more than 50 events that are planned. It's amazing what departments and schools and colleges and various offices have done. It is just amazing. We have those 50, over 50 events planned, including the debut of PDX Talks, featuring fearless stories from our faculty. And then there are also handouts about Portland State of Mind in the back of the room, so make sure as you leave you pick them up. So now I get to close the program with an invitation um, to all of you to stay, talk with one another. We have refreshments. The balcony is open. Um, I know that it's not exactly the nicest Portland weather, um, but we hope that you hang around in the balcony. We're going to open up some more space. Feel free to move these chairs around and visit with one another, but I hope that we're off to a great start for the academic year, and I think this is when I might say go Vikes. We said it to the students. We can certainly say it to our faculty. So welcome, and we hope we have a great year. Thanks. <laughs>